Hello and welcome to another edition of The Debate. I'm Kavit Hadways. The third day of nuclear negotiations between Iran and the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany in Geneva. Well, in an exclusive interview with Press TV, Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif says that Tehran's right to enrichment is non-negotiable and a red line and that any deal with the world powers should include Tehran's enrichment right. In this debate, we'll discuss how far the discussions have come and also ask the possibilities of a breakthrough. Let me introduce our guest, co-director of the International Action Center, Sarah Flounders, joins us from New York. We have senior fellow at the Congressional Defense Policy Advisor, Frederick Peterson, who joins us from Washington. I'd like to welcome both of you. Frederick Peterson, let me start with you. The latest headline that we uh, ran, and uh, it seems to show progress, that Iran and the P5 plus 1 uh, have agreed on 90 percent of issues, four differences to remain, two of which are primary importance. Now, uh, we're looking at an interim uh, deal here for the period of six months, while a comprehensive final pact is devised, and the IEA's most recent report has said Iran has put the brakes on nuclear expansion, enrichment to have been sold to virtual halt. What is the problem here? Well, uh, you're correct. We may be 90 percent there, but running 90 percent of a marathon is not completing a marathon. Uh, the last 10 percent, the last tenths of a mile, in fact, can be the most rigorous and the most difficult and can actually threaten everything that has gone before it. What we are seeking is a final agreement with a capital A, and that can only be done when, when all of the negotiations are met to the satisfaction, uh, satisfactory conclusion of both sides. Uh, we should say that uh, this issue of empowering uh, nuclear materials, enriching nuclear materials beyond a certain point, therefore threatening uh, those materials going from the stage of nuclear power to a nuclear weaponization um, is the sticking point. It always has been, and it's a matter of good faith, in fact, on both sides, to decide at what point they are willing to have faith and trust in the other and move forward. Uh, the issue of nuclear power in the region to provide the power needs of a country is one of many. Nuclear power is being widely criticized in the United States, certainly in Japan after recent accidents, where we have uh, solar panels and wind farms. Uh, but the nuclear issue is particularly sticky because there has never been a solar panel that's been weaponized or a wind farm that has been turned into a weapon of mass destruction. We do have that with the nuclear issue, the possibility of that. The UN Security Council has made its will clear and they may be within the last 10 percent of a solution, but the time clock is ticking on this and it is urgent for both sides in good faith to come to a conclusion that will meet the needs of security, uh, confidence in the region, and, uh, and also the power needs of Iran, quite frankly, and well, the sovereignty of Iran and being able to decide its own fate within responsible bounds. You know, it's interesting, uh, Frederick Peterson, they use the words, uh, for example, security, uh, and that time is ticking. And I'd like to use those words, uh, if I may, uh, Sarah Flounders, and my question to you. When we're looking at the P5 plus 1 or the E3 plus 3, as they like to call it, each one of those countries, well, they all have nuclear weapons. And here they are uh, trying to dictate to Iran certain terms of which Iran has come in good faith. And as a signatory to the NPT, uh, it, it's, it, it's almost as if they, well, it's not almost as if they have put the onus on Iran. Uh, but Iran has come forward. It's a signatory to the NPT. And at this point, uh, closing the gap on uh, trying to rest assure the international community comprised with this B5 plus one that they are not after weaponizing, not to mention national intelligence estimates to come out and said there has been no uh, diversion. Isn't there something ironic in that, in the way that this scenario is set up? Well, it's absolutely a fraud from the very beginning. It's important to recognize this has nothing to do with concern and fear of nuclear weapons because every one of these countries are nuclear powers. 
and have nuclear energy, of course, have nuclear weapons. They are making no demands for an accounting of Israel's nuclear weapons or uh, implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So all the demands are on Iran. And it's also important to always remember that the sanctions on Iran began long before uh, Iran began its nuclear energy program. And Iran has every right to the development of nuclear energy. This is really about U.S continually trying to destabilize the region, making threats in the region, and also trying to restrain the development of any independent sovereign direction of any country in the region. And willing to use, uh, of course, Israel and Saudi Arabia, th th supposed threats from the US Congress, one implement after another, saying, well, we can't have an agreement because of this or that demand. Uh, the sanctions are the real crime, not Iran developing nuclear energy. The sanctions are a crime against humanity. They're a crime against peace. They absolutely should be ended. And we're very hopeful of uh, Iran progressing in these talks, but we should know where the real threat is coming from, and that is coming from the U.S. effort to dominate the region and to keep it destabilized. Frederick Pearson, do you agree? Well, quite obviously not. I mean, if the question was stated in terms of power, not nuclear power, uh, and that is the way Iran is stating the question, and they certainly have a right uh, and an obligation to develop the power needs of its own people. If nuclear, the, the word nuclear was taken out of that equation, they would find ready partners within the area. But to throw into the mix a technology that can be weaponized and to simply point to the neighbors, the United States, Israel, others within the region that are part of the UN Security Council that have nuclear weapons is to undermine the very argument that's being used by Iran that this question is in fact about nuclearization of weaponry, not of power. And I would say that if it truly was about power on both sides, that there should very, that last 10 yards should be able to be crossed very readily where the uh, both sides would be able to agree on the regimens needed in order to enforce and ensure a denuclearization of the region and the power needs of the Iranian people being met. But it is the weapons issue, as the other guest uh, rightly noted, that is the sticking point. And I, I don't buy the uh, the argument the United States is attempting to enforce its will on a region. The United States is attempting with others and the UN Security Council to, uh, to enable peace within the region, which is the friend of all sides. Sir, Sir Flanders. Well, just to again respond that the very fact that U.S. threats, destabilization, and sanctions on Iran began before Iran began its development of nuclear energy, uh, I think shows a real intent of U.S. sanctions in the region. Uh, also, it's not only against Iran that the U.S. makes threats. The very arming of the state of Israel as a destabilizing force in the region has continued for decades the threats right now in Syria. U.S. interests are in destabilization of the region and stopping the peaceful development of Iran on every level. And that is what the sanctions are intended to do. Frederick Pearson, it's interesting, uh, there, uh, at this point, uh, based on uh, <coughs> Iran's Foreign Minister, Mohammad Javad Zari, three or four issues of differences remain with one or two stronger. And we have uh, a new source saying that the two issues are Iran's right to enrichment as well as this uh, under construction heavy water reactor in Iraq. Now, regarding the enrichment, we could talk about Iran's right signatory to the NPT under Article 4, but there seems to be an interpretation uh, that the P5 plus 1 countries have that uh, that right is not actually stated and enshrined in the NPT. 
that's one part of the discussion. But the other part, this heavy water reactor of Iraq, you know, I'm looking at 2014 completion date that may be even delayed further. Uh, is the reactor itself is for producing uh, medical isotopes. Uh, why all of a sudden now this has become a sticking point when before it wasn't? Well, I think that Iran has agreed, at least in principle, not in writing, there was no conclusion yet. Their uh, offer was to uh, limit at 20% the, uh, the empowering of the isotopes uh, within their plant. The proof is in the pudding, and in the inf not just the, uh, the uh, methods that are used to supervise this and also to enforce this agreement. And I think that is the sticking point. And as we discuss that last 10 yards, as we have said, it's extremely difficult. Uh, this nuclear issue, I should say, is becoming less and less an issue as a selection, as a power option for a region in much of the rest of the world. And I think the sub rosa uh, argument and objective here is not necessarily oriented toward uh, power for consumers and for a nation, it is the exercise of power politics in the form of weaponization. After all the words wash away, that is the raw truth with which we are dealing. Recognizing that, the issue becomes much more clear and the sides can contribute to a debate with much better faith. Understanding differences of opinion and uh, definitions of sovereignty, but the issue will be very clear. We are dealing with the question of national security, power politics, and weaponization of the nuclear product of uh, the power plants that are being constructed. If either side, if both sides can reach an agreement as to what is a safe zone in which to operate with comfort on both sides, nuclear power can be endorsed. But I go back to the statement again. If this really was about power, why not celebrate all of the parties working together to come up with solar, wind farms, other technologies that are very promising and on the horizon and working for the power needs of the region together uh, instead of something that can be used to destabilize a region and uh, we're using false arguments of uh, a civilian power to really rep uh, represent weapon weaponized power. Well, uh, let's look at power politics, as Frederick Peterson said to their Sarah Flounders. And uh, I found it interesting, based on a source here, uh, I'd like to get your reaction, that paints a, a, a sort of a different picture about the, uh, the way that the U.S. is viewing Iran, based on the uh, warming of relations, uh, of course, in reference uh, of this particular source, uh, the phone call between... Uh, the U.S. president and Iran's president, that uh, it's uh, based on the source, uh, the U.S. is looking as to bringing Iran into the region as uh, being uh, one of the major powers. And uh, this uh, is while Israel and Saudi Arabia, the uh, two of the closest allies of the U.S., are slipping away and they're going different ways uh, based on uh, the warm uh, approach that has been established between Iran and the U.S. Do you agree with that uh, particular viewpoint? Well, as part of talks, there always uh, is an undercurrent of what other concessions can the U.S. gain from Iran. Uh, this is very much about power politics and what concessions could they gain in the region because the U.S. seeks to dominate the region and is willing to recognize Iran as a power in the region as long as Iran is willing to play ball by U.S. terms, which are always completely unequal terms. Well, and uh, that is really the problem today. Okay, uh, let me come to you, Frederick Peterson. You know, Sarah Flounders talked about, about how uh, Iran has to play on U.S. terms. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if we want to take a look at the region, we're looking at Iraq, uh, of course, Afghanistan on the other side. We're looking at, uh, uh, what other countries uh, can I mention here? Syria. We're looking at, uh, uh, for example, these two countries of which uh, obviously Iran plays a major role. 
uh, Iran has been a uh, major player in the region. Uh, so isn't it that uh, the U.S. and Iran uh, in areas of mutual interest can cooperate with each other? And this particular deal, uh, this nuclear deal which Iran is entitled to, is just a stepping stone perhaps going in that direction or alongside with that once an interim agreement is reached? I'm, I'm so pleased that you put it that way because that is precisely <clears throat> what we should be reaching for. Uh, we certainly and rightfully should and do recognize Iran as an important player in that part of the world. Uh, and in fact, in the world stage at large, uh, Iran has a long history of leadership within the world community and properly should step up to that role. World leaders must act with vision and responsibility with their neighbors. And statements such as calling a neighbor a rabid dog does not contribute to agreement within the neighborhood. I would hope that we could put this kind of rhetoric aside and reach together in brotherhood with Iran and with each of the members of the community to, to, to reach a regional hegemony of peace within the region. It can be done, the power issue, and of course, eliminating, not just reducing, but eliminating the sanctions against Iran can also be an inducement to uh, responsible cooperation. There are other uh, uh, elements on which the United States and the other's neighbors within the region should be able to negotiate uh, an agreement which is comfortable for all sides, but all sides must negotiate in good faith responsibly reaching toward good ends and peace, prosperity, and equity within the region. If that is done, this may be a seminal moment in the, uh, the history of the region. I hope that it is. Sir Flanders, I know you have a reaction, but let's uh, take a look at some viewer comments. We've been overflooded with them, uh, especially this being the third day of these talks, as posted on our Facebook page. Saudi Arabia and Israel are trying their level best for this deal not to happen. The number one strategy here for the Zionists is to torpedo these talks and feign that diplomacy has been exhausted. I respectfully suggest Iran adopt my line. War is only a solution if peace is your problem. Ratchet up more sanctions with effective measures. Propaganda against Iran. For 33 years, they've been telling us that Iran almost has a nuclear weapon. They never stop supporting Israel. Some of the comments there. Uh, Sarah Flounders, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, viewer comment number one, are trying their level best for this deal not to happen. Now, you know what's interesting, Sarah Flounders, is why would they not want this deal to happen? I mean, uh, Israel, uh, they're saying Iran is going to get the nuclear bomb based on what they're saying. Well, this is going to have more mandates of inspection hours on top of the 5,000 visits that the IAEA has had. Saudi Arabia also worried about uh, Iran, uh, again, based on their opinion, going after nuclear weapons. Again, this is going to safeguard any concerns perhaps they have. So what uh, reasons would they have not wanting this to happen? Well, both Israel and Saudi Arabia are U.S. war proxies in the region. Their very reason for existence for the billions of dollars of arms and equipment, diplomatic support, political support that they get is to be a threat in the region. And they know that the very future of their role is threatened in any kind of a peace agreement. So, of course, they're against it. But the U.S. also wants them to be against it. In other words, they're operating, on the one hand, talking diplomacy, but also letting their proxies continue the threat. It is important to recognize that Iran is the one country in the region that time and again has called for a nuclear weapons free zone. And it is the U.S. who's brought nuclear weapons into the region, and it's Israel who has hundreds of nuclear weapons completely unaccounted for and not a signator to any agreement. So we should step back from this fraud that this is about nuclear weapons. Both U.S. intelligence, Israeli intelligence know that 
Iran has no nuclear weapons, no nuclear military program. Enriching uranium to 20% is not the 90% that is required for nuclear weapons. Well. So it is really important for people around the world to call for an end to the sanctions, an end to the threats, and to recognize the right of Iran, its sovereign right to develop nuclear energy and its right to develop as a country in the region, its trade, its infrastructure, and everything for the health and well-being of its people. Frederick Peterson, last comment, 30 seconds or less. Are we looking at an interim deal or not? Unfortunately, I think that last 10 yards is going to be very difficult to come across. If I may throw out uh, Secretary of State Kerry's latest observation, we are at the initial stages of determining whether or not there is a first step that could be taken. <clears throat> Certainly, that would not resolve any issues in a first step. That doesn't sound like a very confidence-building measure for the last 10 yards for me, although I believe that um, this is, as your other guest has said, about not just nuclear power, but weaponization of nuclear power within the region. If we are able to overcome that, I believe an agreement should be at hand for the benefit of all within the region and for the economic benefit of Iran and the ending of sanctions. Thank Sir, you. Sarah Flounders, uh, last statements here, 30 seconds or less. Yes, end the sanctions on Iran, allow the nuclear energy development of Iran and respect the sovereignty of Iran. Thank you very much for that. Co-director of International Action Center, Sarah Flounders there, and Senior Fellow and Congressional Defense Policy Advisor, Frederick Peterson, uh, were our two guests for this edition of the debate. From me, Governor Tapley, and the entire team here in the Capitol, Tehran, it's goodbye.